lesson for January 3rd is entitled, God Judges Unrighteousness. The key verse is from Isaiah 2, 4, which says, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. The scripture is from Isaiah 2, verse 4, and 21, verses 1 through 10. The lesson focus is, unrighteousness has been, is being, and will be judged. The overview says that being a true prophet is a difficult task. A prophet must declare the message that God reveals. The vision must be depicted just as shown. It must be delivered to the audience for which it was intended. Likewise, studying what a prophet has declared is not easy. What he said, or the principle of what he said, may have personal application to the one who studies that message. The application may not always be appreciated, and it is easy to tune out that part of the study. The stronger the temptation to tune out may indicate the greater need to give heed to what was said. The introduction says, Many nations were called to account by God through the prophet Isaiah. Our study for today is about the country of Chaldea, whose capital was Babylon. Their behavior was typical of what the other nations or peoples were doing. Wherever there are people, a judicial plan or system of rewards and punishment must be established. Otherwise, the anarchy and confusion that comes of self-centered anti-love will prevail. Also, the moral nature of God, His holiness, truthfulness, and justice require rewarding righteousness and punishing unrighteousness. God spoke many times through Isaiah about the hideousness of sin and the great horror that would follow unless sin was confessed and forsaken. Like it or not, each of us will face judgment unless we repent and believe in Christ. Ready or not, the judgment day is coming. In part one, it says, Our sins have been judged. And the text is from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, which says, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Isaiah's vision in chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 depicts Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. They had been judged and suffered the consequences of fallen humankind. They had been punished for their many sins against God. Isaiah looked into the future and saw better days for them. He saw what it would be like in the last days. Wars had ceased. Universal peace prevailed, and the people of God had achieved remarkable progress. The last days of this passage are not specifically defined. The how and when of the last days are yet to come. Sin has left a wake of sorrow and suffering. We do not know how much longer or the extent of suffering we shall yet face. But better times are coming. Universal peace will prevail. Spiritual prosperity will abound. An Eden-like atmosphere will predominate. A statue stands in the United Nations Garden in New York City, donated by the former Soviet Union in 1959. It features the likeness of a muscular man holding a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. He grips the hammer high over his head as if he is about to bring it down against the sword, which he is beating into a plowshare. In fact, the base of the statue bears the inscription, We shall beat our swords into plowshares. How fascinating that in our secular world, a nation that described itself as atheistic would donate a statue with a paraphrase of a Bible verse found in both Isaiah 2, 4, and Micah 4 3. It symbolizes the age old desire to take the weapons of war and transform them into instruments of peace. 
a noble aspiration. Meanwhile, the world waits for the one who will judge between nations and settle disputes to come and bring true peace. In part two, it says unrighteousness is being judged, and the text is from Isaiah 21, verses 1 through 5, which says, A prophecy against the desert by the sea, like whirlwind sweeping through the southland, an invader comes from the desert, from a land of terror. A dire vision has been shown to me. The traitor betrays, the looter takes loot. Elam, attack. Medea, lay siege. I will bring to an end all the groaning she caused. At this my body is racked with pain. Pangs seize me like those of a woman in labor. I am staggered by what I hear. I am bewildered by what I see. My heart falters. Fear makes me tremble. The twilight I long for has become a horror to me. They set the tables. They spread the rugs. They eat. They drink. Get up, you officers. Oil the shields. Isaiah set the right example for all times. For those God has called to proclaim judgment on unrighteousness, he was faithful to proclaim this dreadful truth. He did it, not with gleeful delight, but with compassionate sorrow. We can almost sense tears in his eyes, hear brokenness in his voice, and feel the pain in his heart. He seems to have delivered this serious message more as a sad lament and a judgmental denunciation. Ponder carefully how he described his inner feelings when he saw the horrible judgment that was to fall on Babylon. At this my body is racked with pain. Pangs seize me like those of a woman in labor. I am staggered by what I hear. I am bewildered by what I see. My heart falters. Fear makes me tremble. The twilight I longed for has become a horror to me. Babylon was preoccupied with its wickedness, drunkenness, idolatry, and indifference. They felt secure behind those double walls. Their arrogance was astonishing. Facing judgment was far from their minds and plans. To add to their iniquity, Belshazzar directed them to desecrate the holy vessels that were used for worshiping God in the temple of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar had plundered the temple and taken the sacred vessels to Babylon. The handwriting on the wall ended the arrogance and drinking. The knee-shaking Belshazzar was told, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found it wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. The guilty conscience nags, condemns, and judges unrighteousness. Some of the wicked often have a prodigal son awareness and declare, I have sinned. Others, like King Saul, merely admit, Surely I have acted like a fool. The conscience whispers, You are a failure. You have really messed up your life. Life independent of God's love and light produces misery and darkness. For good reason, the accusing conscience renders harsh judgments. In part 3, it says unrighteousness will be judged. And the text is from Isaiah 21 verses 6 through 10, which says, This is what the Lord says to me. Go, post a lookout and have him report what he sees. When he sees chariots with teams of horses, riders on donkeys or riders on camels, let him be alert, fully alert. And the lookout shouted, Day after day, my lord, I stand on the watchtower. Every night I stay at my post. Look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses. And he gives back the answer. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. All the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. My people who are crushed on the threshing floor, 
I tell you what I have heard from the Lord Almighty, from the God of Israel. There seems to be a pause or break in the prophet's agonizing vision. He must have needed a rest. Then God gave him a direct message to deliver. Post a lookout and have him report what he sees. The lookout was faithful to his assignment. Day after day, my lord, I stand on the watchtower. Every night I stay at my post. The time lag in the events Isaiah predicted was approximately 200 years before Babylon was destroyed. The faithfulness of the man on lookout duty was rewarded. He declared, Look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses, and he gives back the answer. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. All the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. The gods of gold, as well as all the other gods Belshazzar depended on for protection, were useless. They were shattered, lying helpless on the ground. Isaiah closed his message with this lament. My people who are crushed on the threshing floor, I tell you what I have heard from the Lord Almighty, from the God of Israel. He saw these unidentified people crushed on the threshing floor. Scholars are divided as to whether he was talking to Israel or to Babylon. Final judgment is coming to all humankind. Isaiah used a metaphor of threshing and winnowing grain to describe the final phase of judgment. Those methods of harvest and threshing are still used in some parts of the world. The grain is trampled under the feet of animals and cartwheels to separate it from the stalks. The kernels are gathered in a sieve, shaken, and tossed about to allow the wind to blow away the chaff. The grain is then put in bags or storage containers. Threshing and separating are the applications God desired to make to those he referred to as my people. Jesus also made use of separation to describe what will take place at the judgment day. We know neither the day nor the hour when the judgment will occur. Nonetheless, it will come. Eternal separation will happen at the judgment day. We will all stand before Jesus, who will welcome the righteous to be with him. The unrighteous will depart to be with the devil and his fallen angels. Are you ready for that day? In today's life application, it says the essence of God's judgment of unrighteousness is as follows. A day of judgment is coming to all of us nations and individuals alike the judge of the earth will do right the standard of judgment will be righteousness and justice the basis of judgment will be the word of god